On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with energy healing researcher and practitioner, Bernadette Doran. I wanted to circle back around to the very beginning when we talked about mind-body medicine and the role of consciousness. Dr. Bengston's work is a jaw-dropping proof to me, which is how I found him. Ten years ago, I saw some of his mouse experiments published in in, in, uh, peer-reviewed journals. Jaw-dropping proof that a conscious belief in something, a conscious awareness of something is not required for energy therapy. These are mice. Now, you know, I don't know a lot about mouse consciousness, but I'm pretty sure it's not like, hey, Minnie, who's that guy putting his hands on the cage? I don't believe that anything is going to happen. Just have faith and imagine those little cells die. Right, right, exactly. None of that is required. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, we're going to talk about energy healing. And since this interview that you're going to hear in a few minutes is also featured in this book that I'm writing that I keep telling you about, Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything, I thought I might do an audio version of one of the chapters from this book that includes this interview with Bernadette Doran. So I don't think you're going to need much more of an introduction than that to appreciate what's going on. This is from Chapter 9 of Why Science is Wrong About Almost Everything. The chapter is titled, Wrong About Healing and Medicine. Like a lot of middle-aged men, I don't like going to the doctor. But in 2013, I started experiencing severe heart palpitations. I felt like I was having a heart attack three or four times a day, and I knew I had to see a physician. After looking up the name of my doctor, who I hadn't seen in five years, I made an appointment. It's amazing how quickly they schedule your visit when you tell them you're a man in your 50s with heart pains. After a few in-office tests and an EKG, My doctor could find nothing wrong with me and sent me home. I was relieved but still concerned. Despite all the tests, I was experiencing strong heart palpitations every day. After a couple of months, I went back to the doctor and said, Look, I know you didn't find anything the first time around, but I'm concerned, and I'm not generally someone who obsesses about their health. My doctor did another exam. Then she ran another EKG. Then she came back in, listened very carefully to my heart, and said, We've got to get you right over to a cardiologist. You need to go now. We're scheduling an appointment for you. My sense of satisfaction about being right quickly turned to fear about what was going to come next. Of course, medical stories like mine often have twists and turns. With me, Obamacare intervened. Within hours after my appointment with the cardiologist was set, I received a call telling me Obamacare laws had gone into effect that very day and my insurance was no longer in effect at that hospital. I called my insurance agent and found myself in an insurance limbo. I would either have to change health care systems, including switching doctors that everyone in my family had used for years, or I would have to wait 30 days for my new insurance to take effect. I decided to wait a decision completely against my doctor's advice. In fact, she called up and told me, okay, if you have a heart attack, here's what to do. Here's what to tell the ambulance. I was starting to question my decision. And that's when I remembered my interview with Dr. William Bankston. So since I'm not going to include for you my interview with Dr. William Bankston, because it's in the library of old shows for Skeptico, I will just remind you that Dr. Bankston is a sociology professor at St. Joseph's College in New York who has done just some amazing things with energy healing, which he happened to just kind of kind of stumble into. He's a highly regarded academic, a very rigorous researcher, been elected president multiple times of the Society for Scientific Exploration, a very impressive group if you've ever checked them out. So in this chapter, then, I talk about my interview with Dr. Bankston and his amazing work studying energy healing, his own energy healing, with animals and with people. 
and then I move on and talk about my specific experience with Bernadette Doran. Here's that. Dr. William Bankston is an impressive guy, and while his unexplainable methods and too-good-to-be-true results left a lot of unanswered questions, his approach and rigor left an impression on me. So when I needed healing, I looked for a healer that used the Bankston method. With a little help from Dr. Bankston, I found Bernadette Doran, an energy healer in Chicago. I decided to schedule a healing with her while I waited in insurance limbo. I also decided to chronicle my experiences with her for Skeptico. And I am doing so here. Here is my interview, now several months old, but still relevant, with Bernadette Doran. Today we welcome Bernadette Doran to Skeptico. Bernadette is the director of Equilibrium Energy and Education, a group out of Chicago that is very much interested in doing some great work in the area of energy healing. So, Bernadette, first, let me thank you and welcome you to Skeptico. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So, your group, this is going, this, first of all, let me say that this show is going to be a bit of a departure from topics that we normally talk about in terms of consciousness science. But I think the further we get into it, folks will see that it is not at all a departure from the topics that we talk about. But let's start by having you tell folks a little bit about this group, E3, and what you do there, and some of the recent things that have come up. I guess I throw that out there because one of the things that drew me to you was you recently hosted a seminar with Dr. William Bankston, who is a former guest on this show and someone who people who've listened to the show kind of know about his amazing work in doing energy healing in a clinical controlled experiment with rats that had cancer. So in the process, I'm sorry to go on here, but in the process of introducing E3, do tell us about your work with Dr. Bankston. Thank you so much. Well, I think we are one of a kind. Equilibrium Energy and Education um, is a research-based energy therapy wellness center. That's the simplest way we describe ourselves. Now, research-based for a lot of reasons. First of all, I was actually a biology major in college, and my my career and my life took kind of a winding, peripatetic turn. But um, the most important thing to me, and, and also I must add, I lived in California for some years, and there's a lot of wonderful things going on in energy therapy, but a lot of it, there's no way to know if it's any good, what it's doing, what its potential is. A lot of stuff, honestly, is just weird, you know, that some people do. And so... um, The whole point of opening Equilibrium was to create a place where people could come and have therapies as well as learn how to do therapies on themselves and their loved ones as well as be certified in certain certifiable therapies that are proven. End of story. Proven. I always say if I can't prove it to you, I'm not going to do it to you. Well, let's let's stop right there for a second and give people a sense for what we're talking about when we talk about therapies, what we're talking about, even with energy healing. I think most people are familiar with the basic idea, but maybe start from the beginning and in particular, hone in on these therapies, because I think that'll create a reaction for some people. And then the idea of of proven and how you would go about that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, First of all, energy therapies are, there's a a wide variety of a kind of therapies that are non-physical, non-physical in the sense of Western medicine. Take a pill, cut you open. Take a pill, cut you open. They're not physical. They're not invasive. All the energy therapies we do here stimulate your body's own chemistry set to rebalance itself. That's the easiest definition of energy therapies I can give you. The way they work is basically quantum physics, and I would probably need an extra 200 IQ points to explain all of that, although there are a couple of books we always refer people to to help understand this, and I would certainly suggest The Basic Code of the Universe by an Italian 
doctor, physician, Misimo Citro, C-I-T-R-O. Um, that explains not only the basis of quantum physics, the basis of interconnectedness of consciousness, the basic interconnectedness of energetic um, uh, 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 electromagnetic energy to help people understand all kinds of things. And one of the things is how energy healing works, not only in person, but absent healing. And that's a whole other category. But, but, uh, but how I would describe energy therapy is different frequencies of energy. And each therapy has its own frequency, except for Bangston. That's another amazing thing. It actually adjusts its frequency to you. Um, but most other energy modalities have a specific frequency that stimulate your own body's um, natural systems to rebalance themselves. That's, in a nutshell, what energy therapy is. Bernadette, let me jump in there again, because I can already hear in my head the pushback from a lot of people. And you went through a lot of points there that I think are good, but I want to try and break them down even simpler. First of all, this whole idea of, of energy healing is an outgrowth of this whole movement of mind body medicine, right? So this yes, whole that, is, that is absolutely correct. Right. So this whole idea that we've been exploring and has gained some kind of credibility among conventional medicine, hey, that there's more to the body than just the physical. There seems to be this interaction with the mind, and we don't know quite how it works, but heck, we have this placebo effect and we can't get around it, and it seems stronger than our strongest medicines. Maybe we, take, maybe we better take another look at it. And then the other point you made is that some people have gone further and said, well, you know, if I really dive into this mind brain thing, there's this consciousness thing, yes, that is in your mind, but there's also there's this energy element that we can't, again, quite put our finger on, but it does seem to be able to be moved around and adjusted and shifted. And we go into other cultures and they seem to have a long history of that. And then as you alluded to, we don't fully understand quantum physics, but when we start hearing some of the terms and ideas and concepts in quantum physics, we say, huh, might that not be an explanation for all this other stuff we see going on? So with that, I, I, I just want to say that I think I just really support people who are willing to then venture out as you are and say, okay, we don't understand everything about this, but let's start using the tools and methods of science that we have to start applying some of these techniques and seeing if we can measure the results. So kind of a black box thing. We don't know exactly what's going on, but let's see if we do this. Let's see if we can measure on the other end what comes out here and see whether it's efficacious in the same way that we do with many of the other more conventional treatments that we have. And it's really medical history. I mean, that's how medicine has always advanced in its therapies and we've refined it and we've tried to understand better about the treatments that we use and what they really do. But in the end, if you really get for re really get real about reading our medical history, a lot of times we didn't know exactly how or why the treatments we were using on people were effective. We just measured as healthcare givers that, and I'm not a healthcare giver, but healthcare givers measured, Hey, this seems to be helping people. So jump in there and, 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 and tell me what I'm missing or what you would add to that. <laughs> oh, you're not missing anything at all. And there's so many new doorways you've opened up for discussion here. But first, I, you know, I want, I want to go immediately to your remark about medical history. And, you know, a, a lot of your listeners may already know this story and you may know this story. The thing about energy, energy therapies, is that they are invisible. That's the most difficult thing. That's, that's why moving forward in this very highly valuable therapeutic direction is so challenging for us. Because if it's invisible, people don't think of it as something valuable or useful. If you're used to taking an aspirin, if you're, you know, if, if, if you're used to something physical from the medical community, then you can't imagine Imagine, number one, or then as a corollary, number two, even fathom that something invisible could be helping you. Now, the example I want to use in this, um, I'm not sure what the year was, 
but uh, I want to say the late 1800s or early 1900s, uh, a, a dramatic shift was made. It was before the invention of the micro, uh, microscope, so whenever that occurred, that's the time we're talking about. But there was a huge, extremely high mortality rate of women during childbirth. I want to say around 50%, something like that. And uh, people just took it for granted. Oh, well, you have a baby, you might die. There you go, you know. Well, there was a physician who had the idea, he noticed that doctors did not wash their hands after handling one patient. They just went on to the next patient, next patient. It was just his idea. It was just, I don't know if it was an intuition, if it was his own personal science experiment, or if he was just, you know, really into personal hygiene, but he decided to see if it would make a difference. And so he went out of his way absolutely every single time to wash his hands after going from one delivery, uh, one woman who delivered her baby to another. And the mortality rate in his hospital plummeted once he started doing that. Well, not that, and, and he, he was the object, he was a laughing stock of, of his hospital. People made fun of him, they thought he was crazy, they thought he was ridiculous. Well, some years later, the microscope was invented and people could see the microbes on their hands. And so what all of those doctors for all that time were doing was transferring infected matter from one person to another, to another, to another. Women got septic and all kinds of things and died. This was a doctor who just moved forward with a theory that he thought would work. It was proven, but he became the laughing stock of a lot of people. And actually, I sadly discovered in Larry Dosey's new book, One Mind, he actually committed suicide because he felt so, he had become such an outlier and felt so rejected by the community. But it changed, it changed the course of medical history. Now every doctor washes their hands. Every, they use latex gloves. They use all kinds of sanitary precautions. And so the death rate has dropped dramatically in all kinds of ways. But if it wasn't for that one guy who said, I can't see anything on my hands, you know, and, and he would say, the doctor would say, well, look, my hands are fine. They're fine. There's no blood on nothing. You know, well, no, you're, you can't see what's really on them. So that is what I say the state of energy therapies are, energy medicine, the, the state of it right now. Now, um, I must tell you that these kind of therapies are, therapies are far more accepted in other countries than America. Matter of fact, that's how I got my start when I lived and worked in Australia, and that's another part of the story of the interview if you want to get into. But we are we are reluctant to embrace it because we're used to be Western medicine being the only form of therapy, invasive therapy that adds something to the body through ingested medication or take something out of the body through surgery. It, we, are, we are used to a 100% physical form of therapy. So that's why research is so important to us. First of all, we do have a research page on our website, and, and I would certainly invite anyone to take a look because a lot of, when, and when I say a proven therapy, what I mean is what kind of experiments have been done to indicate results from a particular form of therapy? So I'll give you a couple of examples. And also, we do our own original research here, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, too. Please, please do, because I think folks are going to be, and maybe if I can, kind of direct you a little bit, because I'll definitely point I'll, I'll definitely point people to the, the website at equilibrium-e3.com and your page on research where you do have, there's a considerable amount of academic, scientific, medical, peer-reviewed research that you point to. But I think folks would be particularly interested in how an institution like yours, which is really just a, a, a group of practitioners who are using these therapies on people who are trying to make their life better, uh -huh. how you're going about doing your own research. 
Great. Wonderful question. We have an amazing person named Vernon Nicholas, who is our research director. He's a professional researcher. He has been his entire life. But he started his whole research career in, in market research. Um, but that's what he has his degrees in. He's trained in getting data, analyzing data. He's the most objective person you'll ever meet in your life. And so um, he and I took a look at all the different kinds of measurement tools that were out there that were affordable to us, even remotely affordable to us, um, because there are some kinds of different things you can build and buy there are hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, we're just a tiny little place. We've served 5,000 people so far, but we're just a small venture trying to do, you know, trying to help as many people as we can. But um, Vernon, Vernon and I discovered, we, and he and I have been going to energy medicine conferences uh, for the last five years. That's how we met Bill Bankston and, and Larry Dosey and all these other people now that now we work together with. So um, we we discovered something uh, was available called a gas discharge visualization camera. Um, it, the, the, the basic concept started um, in Russia about 20 years ago for this kind of camera. The Russians are really into this stuff. They, they understand the electromagnetics of the body and the, the first cameras, Kirlian cameras, K-I-R-L-I-A-N cameras, were very rudimentary electrical measurements of the electrical impulses of the meridian system. We all have a meridian system. And 5,000 years of um, Chinese medicine, Tibetan uh, medicine, all that kind of stuff, people understand that. Uh, Western medicine doesn't even acknowledge that there is such a thing, but that's how acupuncture is based. There's all kinds of different um, energy therapies that stimulate the meridian system to get the body back in balance. So um, 20 something years later, fast forward, there's an extremely sophisticated version of that earlier um, electrical photographic device concept into something called gas, gas discharge visualization. It's a small camera. All, all of your meridians end in your fingertips and in your toes. And so by when Vernon takes a picture, it's just a little tiny camera. You just put your fingertip down, one fingertip at a time on this little camera. And there's actually a tiny, tiny, tiny infinitesimal electrical charge that you get zapped with to capture what that the energetic state of that meridian in, is in is each finger, and so um, then there's very 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 complex software that instantly analyzes the state of your not only your physical being but also your emotional balance, as well as your physical vitality levels, lots of other things. So what this, and then it analyzes all of that instantly, and Vernon can show you immediately your state of being. He can make the invisible visible. That's the whole point of this, make the invisible visible. And so there are several ways to slice and dice it. He can show which organs, which systems are off, whether an emotional level or physical level, if you're, how low your vitality is compared to average, how stressed you are compared to average, all kinds of amazing things. And all immediately, the whole, the whole, um, uh, uh, um, acquisition of the information as well as the slicing and dicing, you know, by the software, to, it literally takes five minutes, it literally takes five minutes. And so what we do with this, we work very, very, very closely with Bill Bankston with this. Um, we really are his, uh, one of two of his major unofficial clinical data arms of original research. And so uh, we try and capture this information on as many patients, clients as we possibly can. We, we, we do it as an assessment tool. Somebody comes in and says, I don't feel good. What do you guys think is wrong with me? We're not physicians. We cannot diagnose. But we can use this tool to say, well, according to this, you know, your liver's not so good and blah, 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 and this and that. So, um, but in and, addition to... Let me just to, interject here. When you say according to this, what I understand... According to the, to the GDV visualization analysis yeah right. according to you yeah according to your meridian information that we captured moreover what I hear you saying is that you know you have this device that reliably collects 
some biometric data, right? So whatever, whatever somebody thinks about that data, we can probably come to some agreement that this device reliably and consistently collects this data. And then what it's doing, apparently, from what you're telling me, is it then goes into its database of, of the huge database that it has of people with different reported conditions and ailments and matches whether or not those biometrics meet certain criteria for the for that data. So it's it's I think it sounds a little bit more smoke and mirrors ish than I think it is. It's like anything. I mean it's like getting your uh, blood pressure taken, right? And they say, okay, well, you know, here's your blood pressure. And then they go compare that with a database and they say, gee, people of your age, of your health, generally are in this range. You're not in this range. The experience has told us that means this. And it sounds like you're doing somewhat similar to that, right? Yeah, it is somewhat similar to that. And uh, and I, I, yes, yes, that's right. Because he, the the Russian man Karatkov, his name, his last name is Dr. His name is Dr. Karatkov. He has spent. Uh, t- well, he personally probably spent 18 to 20 years collecting that data and analyzing that data and creating the software base that is now an analytical tool for everyone. But the great advantage, not only can we will you just say, Alex, come on down and we'll tell you how you look, even better, we can say, Alex, let me let, let us just take your data. Whoops, here's your data. There you go. You look a little low in the whatever, whatever area. Now let us do a Bangston treatment on you for an hour. Okay, great. Now let us take your data again. This is where the hugely important work comes in that we try and do. We trust this machine to be accurate. We trust all of the research. We trust all of the users around the world who use this in clinical applications and say, okay, we want to show you exactly what this one therapy did for you today, just now, before and after. That is what is so exciting to us. And there are absolutely different, what I would call energetic or frequency signatures to the therapies. There are absolutely different effects to, on people. There's a hugely different visible, we made visible analysis of what Reiki does, for example, compared to what Bangston does, you know, compared to pranic healing, compared to all of these different things. But we can show people, you know, a lot, here's the thing, you know, we put our hands on people and uh, after the therapy is over, everyone always feels relaxed. They might have an emotional release. Their pain might go away and they say, I feel so much better. Thanks. That's great. That's wonderful. That's the whole point. But that's a subjective report. Okay. It's a subjective report. There's nothing that we can say, okay, we're so happy you feel better. But with this, we can say, okay, we're happy you feel better. And look at how much more your heart uh, energy has come back to your whole, uh, you know, our, our, our arterial system has come back into alignment with where it's supposed to be. Look how, look how much less stress you have in your body based on your hormonal responses, all that kind of stuff. That is what we are really excited about because, you know, it's human nature. We don't trust what we can't see. It is, you know. That's why we use cell phones, even though that we do have all kinds of information of how much damage they do um, to the brain, depending and how powerful they are. But anyway, the point is, it's wonderful to be able to hold out something visible for people to see and say, oh, no wonder I feel so much better or no wonder I feel so relaxed. That's great. And that's why all of the data, all of the research collected on our on our website and from what some people, you know, would call especially reliable sources, the National Institute of Health, the feds, you know, the federal government, for example, has a whole arm uh, under its under its control that researches, it's called the uh, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. They very religiously research all kinds of stuff, nutrition, vitamins, energy therapies, whatever. On average, they spend a million dollars every year just researching Reiki, one of our primary, most wonderful, most egalitarian forms of energy therapy that anyone can learn. So 
that is really where, where we're coming from. We all know as practicing therapists, and most of us have had the experience of life-changing events that led us in this direction in the first place, which is why we do it. And so we are walking the talk. We are living proof that it works. But just because I know it works doesn't mean I can prove to you that it works. And so what we are all about is only using, only bringing to the public's attention, only offering proven therapies uh, as well as training in those therapies. And Bill, of course, Bill Bankston, fits in exquisitely because he has 30 years of mouse research, okay, 30 years of animal studies. Perfect. Now what we are doing is amplifying his research base with clinical studies for people who come to us with human human problems, cancer and uh, uh, Alzheimer's, cataracts, uh, gastrointestinal disorders. All, those are all things Bankston Method works phenomenally well for. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Dr. Bankston then. I know that he was recently there at E3 and did a, a seminar with a bunch of folks, and I want to hear more about that. But let's fill people in on a little bit on the details. He was on Skeptico a while back. He is, in addition to being this kind of maverick academic who just really more or less stumbled into energy healing, it wasn't his primary discipline, it wasn't his area, he was just one of these... Guys, I really love that about him is he was just curious and unwilling to let go of a question that seemed to be pursued. So he ran across this phenomena through some gentleman who was able to do this energy healing, and he was just kind of curious. He's like, wow, you know, let's see how far I can push this. Let's see how far I can take this. He was a true scientist, a true yeah, he is a true scientist, but in this case, he demonstrated just this open-mindedness that says, I'm going to keep testing this guy until he fails. If you listen to Bankston, that's really his story. He said, yeah, that's right. I'm going to keep testing this guy until he fails, and he didn't fail. And it eventually led to, as you just alluded to, a most amazing experiment that he did at a New York university where they did an experiment on rats that had been injected with uh, cancer, which is a horrible sounding thing that we would do to an animal, but we do this all the time. It's part of cancer research. And these rats have been bred to the point where they are predictably and reliably dying of cancer after so many days. I think in his case, it was 21 days. And Bankston went ahead and in this clinically controlled, very properly done experiment, did this hands-on, not even hands-on, hands above the cage, energy healing, and the rats not only went into remission but were cured and lived out their natural life. Something that really the, the researchers who are doing cancer research associated with the university said they had never seen before. So... That's really Dr. Bankston's story, and he continues to be this kind of all-round scientific guy who's interested in a lot of different things. He's the current president of the Society for Scientific Exploration, that if anyone knows about that wonderful organization, they investigate all manner of kind of science that doesn't fit normally into conventional paradigms of how things should work. So he's really a kind of broad-minded guy. And I just wanted to fill people in a little bit on that background. Tell us then a little bit about your experience with Dr. Bankston, and in particular, as you just alluded to, the Bankston therapy and, and how you've seen it work in your practice. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. First of all, you know, one of the things I, I wanted to mention, I wanted to circle back around to the very beginning when we talked about mind-body medicine and the role of consciousness. Dr. Bankston's work is a jaw-dropping proof to me, which is how I found him. Ten years ago, I saw some of his mouse experiments published in, in, in uh, peer-reviewed journals. Jaw-dropping proof that, that consciousness, a conscious belief in something, a conscious awareness of something is not required for energy therapy, okay? These are mice. Now, you know, I don't know a lot about mouse consciousness, but I'm pretty sure it's not like, hey, Minnie, who's that guy putting his hands on the cage? I don't believe that anything is going to happen. Oh, Mickey, just do, oh, you know, don't worry, he's a nice man. Just tolerate. have faith. Just have faith and imagine those little white, those little white cells dying, right, or whatever. Right, right, exactly. 
Exactly. None of that is required. None of that is required. And as a matter of fact, it's it's really interesting. If there is any relationship between consciousness and therapy, I so far, based on um, based on everything I've seen with all our therapies, I would say it, it, consciousness gets in the way of healing. To be honest with you, because with the Bengston method and other methods, interestingly, a hundred percent of the successes we've had is with our own animals. You have know, dogs who are sick and stuff like that, and all. Alzheimer's patients. Isn't that interesting? Because there is no consciousness to get in the way. Um, but anyway, that's you know, that's more details. But but you do not need to believe. You do not need to have faith. It is the example I give all the time. What is energy healing like? What's a good analogy? It's like if you take a can of Coke out of the refrigerator, put it on the kitchen table. Very shortly, room temperature, the larger field, the larger field will rebalance the can of Coke so that it is now the same temperature as room temperature. Really, it's that simple in a nutshell. The can of Coke does not have to believe in the room temperature. It does not have have faith in the room temperature. It doesn't have to ask the room temperature to bring it to room temperature. Automatically, the larger field, room temperature, brings that can of Coke into equalized balance. That is what energy therapy does, and I think that's what the, all of the Bengston research, anim, animal research, proves. You, none, no belief, no consciousness, no efforting, anything is required. And as a matter of fact, don't think about it. Don't let it get in the way. So, Dr. Bengston is maybe the most remarkable person I've ever met and worked with. Um, we are huge fans of his. We're members of the SSE also. His his whole therapy is what we are all about um, in terms of what is the potential. What what our interest is, what is the potential of all this stuff, proven potential for helping people maintain equilibrium, right? Maintain equilibrium, maintain a stress-free life, maintain balanced health, all that kind of stuff. All energy medicine therapies, energy therapies are comparable in certain ways, but Dr. Bengston's therapy, the Bengston method of therapy is completely different. It is not a, what I would call a gentle energy therapy. I'm trained in more than a dozen different therapies. Most of the people who work at equilibrium are and when you're a therapist, you you become very sensitive to the different energies moving through you. One therapy feels like this, another therapy feels like that. You 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 just become more sensitive to to the sensation of it. I will tell you that um, Reiki is one of the gentlest therapies. Reiki is like a like a very very gentle mountain stream, very gentle energy moving through, moving through, moving through. Bengston method is like Niagara Fall on steroids. The power of this energy, wherever it's from, whatever it is, however it started in the first place, who knows? But I'll tell you, the power of it is unlike any other energy therapy we are familiar with, and we're familiar with almost all of them. So Bernadette, tell me this. Let's shift gears for a minute here, because what we're actually going to do here, and I'm very excited about it, and it's a little bit of a departure from what we've done in the past on this show is I'm actually going to get uh, a therapy, a, ther- a series of therapeutic treatments from E3, from Equilibrium E3 to help me with a condition. And I'm going to, I'm going to pay you for that and as would be appropriate. And, but I am going to share some of that process with folks as I go through it and what the results might be. So for me, I really would like to do the the Bankston therapy and uh, I, I, for all the reasons that we've just said and talked about and because I do have that personal experience. And this is for me both, I, I do have a, a health issue that I want to address. And at the same time, I want to explore this more fully because as anyone who's listened to this show knows, this exploration of the larger questions of consciousness and our, as a human being, our relationship to consciousness and extended consciousness is really at the core of the of, of what I'm interested in doing. So with that, let's shift gears for a minute. And why don't you tell me as someone who is preparing for a Bankston therapy, what you would tell me and what I need to know and, and ask any questions that you would ask. 
Mm-hmm. Great. Very good. So um, when someone says, I'd like to do Bengston therapy, where there's actually a whole of their very long email that says frequently asked questions about um, Bengston therapy that we send them. So we will be sending you that. And there's there's a couple of things to know in advance. First of all, it seems to us, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to give a, a slightly broader foundation here, there's, there's a whole branch that I'm sure you're very familiar with, of uh, a new branch, about 12 years old now, I think it is, of medicine called psychoneuroimmunology. You can actually now be trained to be a physician who is a psychoneuroimmunologist. And psychoneuroimmunology, tons of research on this, is um, the relationship of em- thoughts and emotions to physical disease. And pretty much everybody, even even in the straight, straight, strict Western medical community, now understands and believes that at least 80, 90 percent, maybe more, of physical diseases um, have an underlying emotional component. And so um, the first thing the Bengston method does is collapse whatever the emotional infrastructure is, whatever the emotional scaffolding is that might have allowed um, the biochemical platform for a disease to manifest, okay? So what that means is after, you know, it is very, very, very common for, I would say, 99.9% of the time, for people who are receiving Bengston therapy, two things happen. They have tremendous emotional releases immediately, like the day after the treatment. You may feel suddenly overwhelmingly sad, suddenly overwhelmingly angry, all kinds of different things for no apparent reason. The reason is the Bengston method is working on that emotional scaffolding first because the physical disease is unlikely to be strongly helped unless that emotional scaffolding is gone. You'll just, it, it, it will just come back. The other way people experience the release of that emotional uh, infrastructure is through dreams. Um, it appears to us that dreams are an extremely uh, efficient evacuation route for emotions and um, a lot of people, especially the first few nights after the first treatment or two, will have dreams about long-standing emotional mm, set points. People who are very fearful have a lot of fearful dreams. People who are angry have a lot of hostile dreams. Very interesting. We are complicated little music boxes, way more than we think about on a day-to-day basis. But the Bengston method helps us kind of slice and dice what all these elements are. So we tell you to expect that. We also tell you to expect to be to feel the need for much, much more sleep than usual. Um, we're not sure why that is. A couple of Vernon and I conjecture that number one, because it's such a powerful therapy, it's doing it's 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 almost it's almost like running your systems in overdrive. It's like doing an eight hour workout at the gym and then just going home and collapsing into sleep. The other thing we also think is that we know and we have several clinical cases where people's belief systems, it's not that they don't believe in the therapy, they have emotional, they have limiting belief systems where that we feel get in the way of the energy helping. And so... um, we believe that the therapy also makes you sleep because then your mind doesn't get in the way and undo what the therapy is trying to do. So we would tell you about that. Okay, now, and, and just to interject again, I don't have to believe any of that. I don't have to accept that that's going to happen. I don't have to try and make that happen. I can be skeptical that that's going to happen. I can say, gee, that probably won't work for me, which I think most people in this situation are most middle-aged men like myself with a, a rather kind of traditional background would say, gee, you know, I, 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 I kind of have my doubts that this is going to happen. And all that's okay, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely, without question, 100% okay. You do not need to believe anything. However, I will tell you, part of the way of generating the therapy, if you're trained in this therapy, there's something that Bill developed early on um, call, is called image cycling. And and what it does, this is a provable thing. Now, if you are interested in 
helping yourself as we are trying to help you. We, and you do not have to do this. You do not have to do this at all. But if you're interested, there's something called image cycling. And how I want to describe this is most of us image cycle all the time for the worse. For example, it's like, oh, my God, my boyfriend's going to leave me. Oh, my God, my child isn't going to get into Harvard. Oh, my God, you know, the, the house is, I'm going to, the house is going to be foreclosed. It's worry, 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 worry. Okay, most of us constantly cycle those worrisome thoughts. It is proven that worrisome thoughts set out a cortisol release that is like an acid bath to the system. So the more you worry, the more the stress hormone cortisol affects all all kinds of organs and systems in your body and lowers and lowers and lowers your immune response. For people we treat, we offer the opportunity, and when we do our experiment, Alex, it's up to you. You want to do this or not? Either way is fine with me. But we offer people, especially if having extremely serious disease or diseases that we know are really stress-based. Most gastrointestinal diseases are worry-based. They're all fear-based diseases for the most part. Um, we offer you something called image cycling. It's Bill's technique that essentially, in a nutshell, is focusing on the positive. And so what that does is if you want to help yourself to have a proven immune boost, you can jump on board. It is not required. It is not necessary. But we offer that it's something you want to do or not do. doesn't matter. We'll help you either way. Okay. Um, Let's see what else. And the only other thing, we we generally prefer to do the therapy at night simply because you will probably fall asleep within five or ten minutes of my starting the treatment. If you want to take a nap during the day, that's totally fine. We could set it up. But we, we always ask you to be lying down, whether you're on the couch, whether you're in bed, you know, whatever. We just don't want you to be, you know, operating every machinery. You know? We will be able to do this over the phone, right? Uh, yes, although it's not required, you, we don't need to be on the phone. We can be on the phone, but a distance healing does not require a physical connection like Skype or the phone or anything like that. Absolutely. A distant healing means that you just lie down and I send you the energy. And that book by Misimo Citro is the way, the best explanation of how the energy is sent. But yes, absolutely. The phone is not required. Okay, that's even easier. I love it. Good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, 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 no. You just go lay down, get your jammies on, get comfy, and, you know, and then I send the, we, we, we agree. We make an appointment. And, um, and we also prefer to do four Bingston treatments as, 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 rather than just one or two or 25 or whatever. We prefer to do four because um, a lot happens. So first of all, the Bingston has to get all those emotional underlying factors out of you and then it starts working on the physical disease and all that kind of stuff. So uh, by the end of four sessions, we will see a difference if this therapy is going to work for you. If it's not the therapy, you're fine. 95% of people have have some differences in some way. And along the way with these four therapies, what we ask is that um, 48, first of all, we don't need to know how you feel during the therapy. Unless you're an energy therapist, most people don't have many feelings. Most people feel sleepy, end of story. So whatever you feel, if you want to share, that's great. It's interesting, but not essential. But um, with 48 hours after each therapy, we require you to email me and describe to me any mental, physical, emotional changes over the last 48 hours, no matter how nuanced they may be, even the tiniest, tiniest change. That is how we can tell what the impact of the therapy is on an ongoing basis. And then by the end of four therapies, based on, of course, your, how you subjectively feel, like, oh my God, I have so much more energy, I can't believe it, or the pain is completely gone, or my stomach doesn't hurt, or whatever it is. And, you know, all of those reports you send me, um, then we can say, okay, great, we're done. Or we can say, you know what, we should do another round of four. Let's let's get rid of that all together. So uh, that's the only other requirement. Also, I require, if for distant therapies, um, I require that you send me a photograph of yourself so I can connect with you a little better. Um, and uh, j just a brief description 
of, of what the current diagnostic state of your condition is. We don't require medical records, you know, doctors, anything like that, uh, x-rays, nothing. But we do require at least a couple of senses. How long ago did this start? What happened? Have you had anything done? You know, what have you been doing for it? Okay, good. Let's go. That sounds pretty pretty simple again. So I'll tell you what, I, I'm not going to go into any specifics on the condition right now, but I will share that information with you via email, and then I will share it with my listeners after this whole therapy is done, and I report on the results. So I think we'll just keep it really simple. That sounds great. Yeah, and, and like any kind of healthcare practice, you know, all confidentiality is 100% maintained. Whatever you want to share with your listeners at the end of this is great, but we are never going to share with anyone the information you send us. Well, great. Bernadette, I think we have we have somewhat of a plan, a treatment plan. I was almost tempted to say, but I don't know if we want to go there. Oh, let's go there. That's fine. I'm excited. This has been a, a fascinating discussion up to this point. I definitely feel like it's not over, but you've you've certainly set the table for this and given people a lot of interesting things to think about. Before we wrap things up here, tell folks a little bit more about how they can get in touch with Equilim E3, mm -hmm. what people are coming to you for, how they would approach you. We're definitely going to have a link to the website, but anything else you want to say, any books or anything like that that, that you have or people in your organization have written that they might want to hear about? Oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, um, the, t the, the, the teachers that we have come here are really the authors that we recommend. Bill Bengston, of course, has his book called The Energy Cure that we sell that explains to the whole history of this therapy as well as how it works and uh, also explains image cycling so you can start boosting your own, your own immune system. Uh, he also has a set of CDs called Hands on Healing. We sell that as well. Another uh, therapy that, that is... Uh, um, quite unique and more and more research based is a form of energy psychology called holographic memory resolution. Uh, it's, it's actually trauma relief. There are other therapies that are um, tra uh, trauma desensitization. This is a whole incredible therapy developed by a guy by the name of Brent Baum that is actually trauma, proven trauma release. It's like shrapnel removal. And he has several books available that are on our website as well. So um, we, we would be delighted for people to check out, if for, if for nothing else, just proven research about these therapies, just for the possibility to go, huh, that's interesting, um, to just at least take a look at our research page to understand that there is a lot of information out there. Our research page, our, our website is www.equilibrium-e3.com. Our phone number is 312-786-1882 here in Chicago. And we can do almost all therapies at a distance. Um, you would have to be in Chicago or fly in um, for a GDV analysis with our research director, Vernon Nicholas. It is a physical machine, so you have to physically be here for that. But just about anything else we do, uh, Reiki, holographic memory resolution, Bankston method, you name it, we 80% of our client base is distant healing around the world. Okay, Bernadette, well, that's fantastic. Again, we're going to wrap things up now, but we look forward to kind of maybe even checking back in with you after this therapy is over. In the meantime, thanks again for joining me on Skeptico. It has been a tremendous pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Alex. So while I was waiting for my cardiologist to accept my insurance, I started doing energy healing sessions with Bernadette Doran. I also began exploring other alternative treatments for my condition. I found an excellent website called StopHeartPalpitations.com, and after doing my own research, followed their dietary recommendations. I realized this was confounding treatments, but I was doing everything I could to restore my health. The energy healing sessions with Bernadette were rather amazing. The first time we scheduled a session, I laid down a few minutes before the healing was to begin. 9 p.m. my local time. Almost immediately, I felt a warm, painful sensation in the middle of my heart. You might expect I would have associated this with the healing, but I didn't. I raised my head and looked at the clock. It was 9.01. That's when I thought, 
there might be something to this energy healing stuff after all. The sensation lasted for a few more minutes, then faded away. I spent the rest of the hour in a somewhat meditative state, then fell asleep. The next day, I felt terrible. Much worse than the day before, I was experiencing severe heart palpitations, pain in the heart, and an upset stomach. I reported this to Bernadette. She immediately told me that this was very common. She told me that I should expect to feel worse for a while after the treatments and then feel better. In fact, over the next couple days, I did begin to feel better. She also told me to notice my dreams. During that first night, I didn't notice anything different about my dreams. During the second night, and at other times during the treatments, I had some very deep, profound dreams that seemed to be related to my healing. During the course of my next three treatments, I continued to be very skeptical and reported the skepticism to Bernadette, but I also kept telling her about my improved health. After the four sessions, Bernadette and I decided to do four more. I still had my doubts about energy healing and about paying someone to send you energy from 2,000 miles away, but I couldn't deny the results either. About a week after the eighth treatment, I finally reached the point where I didn't think about heart palpitations. They weren't there anymore. I've had a couple of mild reoccurrences in the months since, but only mild ones, and very infrequently. I don't know if anyone else would have the same experience. I don't know if it was purely Bernadette's treatment or the change in diet, or if the whole thing was in my head. I don't know, and to some extent, I don't care. I do know that during the period Bernadette was supposed to be sending me energy, I felt a strong sensation, followed by a shift in my health. It was a remarkable experience that I haven't completely absorbed into my worldview. How can a person 2,000 miles away use a very structured technique to somehow channel energy to someone? I don't know, but it certainly defies a mind equals brain understanding of human consciousness. So there you have it. That's one of the chapters from my upcoming book and also the story about my energy healing experience. I hope you enjoyed that. And I'd love to hear from you about any experiences you've had with energy healing, both positive and negative. If you've experienced that too, let me know. Let me know what your experience has been. Of course, the place to do that is through the Skeptico website at S-K-E-P-T-I-K-O dot com. So once you're there, you can jump on over to the Skeptico forum and leave a note over there, or you can comment directly in the show notes following this episode. While you're there, be sure to check out our over 250 previous shows of Skeptico, all available there for a free download, or subscribe to our show on iTunes. Well, that's going to do it for today. I have some interesting shows coming up, and I have to thank our listeners for so many of these shows. And I haven't individually done that, and I probably should. It just never seems to kind of sync up for me to go back and remember all the great recommendations I've had from people. And I've even taken to to lately, you'll notice either in the forum or in Facebook or through private emails, when somebody suggests a guest suggestion, I'll often go, hey, why don't you go contact that person and see if they're interested in being in the show. And I, I love doing that. I love you being involved and being engaged. And I also find that it, it really makes a difference sometimes with guests when they hear from someone other than the show host, and they're able to explain from their perspective why that person should be on the show. So I love that kind of participation, and I certainly love some of the great guests that you all have suggested. So please follow through with that. But I do have to tell you, I'm kind of overbooked right now with more shows than I can get to right at the moment. But do keep the suggestions coming. I, I love to hear that. And I love to hear all your feedback in general. So feel free to drop me an email or a, a note over on Facebook and tell me what you think of the show, good or bad. Always love to hear what people are thinking. Well, that's going to do it for today. I do appreciate you listening. Take care and bye for now. Mm-hmm.